We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Ronnie Stoffele, researcher and fund manager at Incrementum and also the author of the In Gold We Trust report. Thanks for joining me today, Ronnie. Hi, Tom. Good to see you. So in this year's report, it's entitled uh, Monetary Climate Change. So how do these two things go together and how should environmental policies include considerations towards the debt-based monetary system? Well, it's actually a bit of a provocative title. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got the, the, the cover here. So we've got the Statue of Liberty drowning in debt. Um, so we, we wanted to, to, to educate people and, 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 and to, uh, to make the point that nowadays everybody is talking about uh, climate change, about sustainability and so on. Everything that you can buy is uh, sustainable um, f- from, from beer to, um, to government debt to uh, whatever real estate. But I think it's important to also talk about the sustainability of our um, monetary system. And from our point of view, it is not sustainable. And um, I think since since basically um, Richard Nixon temporarily decoupled the US dollar from, from gold, um, that's almost 50 years from now. Um, we're speaking of the the golden wedding. I don't know if, 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 if that works in the English language as well, but if you're married for 50 years, you've got the golden wedding over here, but, um, or the golden anniversary, sorry. Um, but it seems that now this, um, this end of this uh, temporary decoupling is, is, really, uh, is really close. Because from my point of view, if, if we have a look at uh, debt charts, at um, the charts of monetary growth and so on, it is, it is fairly obvious that uh, this is not sustainable. And therefore, we, we, we said, okay, let's, let's talk about those, those topics that are probably as important as uh, the other climate change. So monetary climate change is real. Um, and therefore for us, it was really, uh, really something very dear to our hearts um, to, to talk about it, to address those issues and to, to inform people. So there's there's really five main pillars that you kind of go through in the in this year's report. Um, so why don't we start with the first of, of budgetary nonchalance? What, what does that mean to you, Ronnie? Well, actually, you know, we 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 all know that uh, last year was quite historic, and and uh, uh, that the debt piles that were already pretty high before the COVID crisis that they are now significantly higher, and and I think it's it's clear that um, fiscal conservatism has been in retreat for 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 quite some time and uh over here in the eurozone we had the credo of the the frugal swabian housewife um especially after the greek uh, debt crisis so um everybody tried to get their books in order but but now i think this this is basically over um austerity is out um we're seeing the comeback of of um big government and from from my point of view, it it is really important because uh, politicians and central bankers are, are really um, creative when it comes to finding uh, exceptions to 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 rules that they have decided on or where people have uh, voted on. You know the Maastricht criteria, for example. Um, nobody cares about those rules anymore. So this pretty permissive fiscal zeitgeist has also significant implications for monetary policy. And, 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 and therefore, we dedicate quite a lot of uh, room um, to this first topic of the budgetary nonchalance. Mm-hmm. So the, the second one is, is the merging of monetary and fiscal policy. And um, kind of a quote that you have in there is this closer liaison between monetary and fiscal policy grows and the longer it persists, the greater the likelihood of a loss of confidence. So 
I, I want to talk a little bit about that loss of confidence and what that really means and, and what it can lead to, Ronnie. Well, the leitmotif of uh, the 2019 in Gold We Trust report was the topic of trust. And um, when it comes to trust, I think it's interesting that it's that it's highly asymmetrical. So it takes many, many years, decades um, to build up trust. And then it can take seconds to completely lose this trust. Yeah, Just imagine if you're married for 40 years um, with your wife and then you come home from work a little bit earlier and you see your wife um, with the, I don't know, with the, the tennis trainer or the neighbor or whatever um, <laughs> in bed. So this trust is lost and cannot be rebuilt quickly, if, if it can be rebuilt at all. And I think, you know, um, what, what we're seeing over here, this merging of monetary and fiscal policy is a very dangerous game. And I think that... The, the appointment of former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen as Treasury Secretary, as well as former ECB President Mario Draghi as Italian Prime Minister, I think the symbolic character of that cannot be overestimated. I think that's, that's really a strong sign that the independence of uh, central bankers is basically over. And there's a good reason why uh, at the beginning um, those institutions, central banks, were um, set up as, as being independent. And uh, therefore, I think if, if we really, and it, it, it seems that that's happening, if we really seem to be um, moving into a world of modern monetary theory, if we're moving into a world where we, we don't see any political independence of central banks anymore. I think this is a very dangerous game and it will um, obviously uh, threaten confidence in the stability of the currency. So from my point of view, um, this, this is a topic and this leads to the third point that we're making. Those are the new tasks for monetary policy. And actually, you know, nobody, nobody really, really uh, gave the mandate um, for, for these uh, pretty dramatic changes, but it's happening. And, and therefore, you know, we don't really judge it, but we're just observing that this is happening. So one thing that um, I, I'd like to talk about as well, Ronnie, in, in that vein of this merging of monetary and fiscal policy is, is really this race to inflate and devalue between the US and the, the Euro. And so talk to us a little bit about how there's, it's, it's really a race to the bottom between these two currencies. Well, you know, when it comes to in, to the topic of inflation, it, 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 it's, it's clear it's, that it's becoming more mainstream. But from a contrarian point of view, it doesn't have to mean that it's wrong. Um, I mean, um, I, I think this was the, the argument by many people saying, well, now everybody is, is, is talking about inflation. So um, this is finally over. I don't think so. I think this is just getting started. And, and in the report, we... Um, we dive into the topic and, and we describe actually why we think that now the, the inflationary forces are actually stronger than the deflationary forces. You can imagine it's, it's like a bit like a pendulum that is swinging. And over the last couple of years, we saw that deflationary and disinflationary forces were, were still slightly stronger. And of course, you know, it's demographics, it's a technological advance, it's, it's a debt burden and so on. Um, but now it seems that the inflationary forces are much stronger. And actually, this is something that, of course, um, central banks and, and politicians are hoping for because they keep telling us that inflation rates uh, uh, have been way too low and that we have to change that. Now, what are the most important drivers for, 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 for this conclusion that, that we make? First of all, we say, well, from our point of view, inflation is not a temporary or a transitory phenomenon like um, the Federal Reserve is telling us all the time. They say, well, it's just because of the base effect and so on. From our point of view, it is structural. First of all, I think the, the velocity of money has stabilized. Very important point. Of course, 
through the course of the pandemic, nobody was really making any any big plans for spending, for uh, making uh, big investments and so on. But now this is changing and the velocity of money is stabilizing and will start rising. Second point is um, Asian countries are now starting to export inflation rather than deflation. And we wrote a, a pretty big chapter about that because it's highly important. Third point is we are seeing a structurally weak US dollar. Of course, over the last couple of days, the US dollar was strong. I think it can go to the, the Dixie can go to 94, perhaps even higher. But over the medium to long term, we see a significantly weaker US dollar. Fourth point, globalization is retreating. I think that a second Cold War is currently actually starting. And the, the, the last summit between uh, the Chinese and the US, as well as the G7 summit, are a clear confirmation for that. Then we are seeing that demographics are turning inflationary. And we shouldn't forget that we are seeing um, those new tasks of monetary policy that I um, mentioned briefly before. So actually safeguarding price stability has always been the, the, the primary objective of an independent central bank. And in German, we've got this wonderful term Währungshüter for central bankers, which means guardian of, 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 of the currency. But increasingly we get the impression that central bankers are speaking out more often about those issues and topics like sustainability, climate change, diversity. And they're talking more about those topics than on monetary policy. And for example, over here in the Eurozone, um, Christine Lagarde, against all custom, she made a public statement of support for the Green Party's top candidate for the, for the upcoming German election. This is something that, that was completely unimaginable a couple of years ago. So this self-designation of central bankers as monetary guardians completely seems out of date. And then, of course, we've got some, some, some other drivers for inflation, like inflation targeting, very important point. Um, we're seeing yield curve control being implemented very soon from our point of view. We're seeing that we're moving from monetary dominance to fiscal dominance. So I think that people should focus less on what the Federal Reserve keeps telling us and focus more what the White House is actually announcing. And they're pretty busy with uh, new stimulus programs. And then I think a bit later on, we will see rising wages. So um, this return of wage inflation might actually be the next stage of this inflationary game. So long story short, from our point of view, Inflation isn't temporary, it isn't transitory, it is something that has moved the pendulum from structurally disinflationary environment to a structurally um, inflationary environment. And as, as the topic of inflation is so hot right now, Ronnie, um, you guys have developed a proprietary inflation signal um, several years ago to measure these current inflation trends. So what factors go into this measurement? Well, of course, I can cannot give you the the, the exact recipe of our secret mm -hmm. sauce. Um, but I think for, for us, it's always been important um, to know when to play offense and when to play defense. And um, in US football, I think there's the saying, offense wins games, but defense wins championships. And for us, it, it, it's always been important to... Um, to avoid major drawdowns. And since we started our, our first inflation fund, actually the environment was, was brutal because we, 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 we saw, uh, we didn't see a big trend in, in inflation. And, uh, you know, if, if you were long only mining stocks, for example, um, you would have made really, really big drawdowns uh, uh, over this uh, time span. So we created this inflation signal that is basically telling us when to play offense, when to play defense. And it's important because uh, all the inflation indicators are telling us what happened in the past. So uh, what were the trends over the last couple of months? They're, they're always lagging. While our inflation model is really looking through the, how do you say, the... The, the, real, 
the windshield exactly thanks um so so what are the markets telling us so so we use a number of different uh market based indicators like the price of gold uh, uh obviously uh the gold silver ratio um some uh um uh commodity related prices um and then uh, we've got a, a channel breakout that is basically telling us do we see a rising falling or neutral inflation and our inflation uh, signal it moved to strongly rising inflation april last year um now we we still have it it was slightly weaker uh over 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 fall and it will probably weaken a bit because uh, of the big uh, rotation that we saw after the FOMC meeting, but it is still showing rising inflation. And, and actually, I think that for, for many investors out there, inflation actually is, is a real pain trade. And, and everybody now thinks, okay, well, you know, we believe what the Fed keeps telling us. It is temporary. It is transitory. It is because of the base effect. Inflation will come down again. But what if not? What if not? And, 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 and therefore, um, for our last special report on inflation, um, we use this, um, um, this light motif of uh, uh, the, the, the story, the boy who cried wolf. And if you remember it, you know, two times um, the shepherd warned and, and, uh, that, that the wolves will attack the pack and nothing happened. And then the third time, nobody, he warned again and nobody believed him. And then actually it happened. And uh, I think it's, it's, that's, that's a very good description of what we're seeing now. And, and, and uh, we, we just put out a couple of charts showing how different the current situation is compared to 2008, 2009. We're seeing, for example, for the very first time since the 1970s, during the recession, inflation was also already rising. We're seeing that M2 and other broader monetary aggregates are rising big time, while in 2008, 2009, those, those uh, uh, credit growth rates were collapsing. So now it is really a completely different story. And I think the markets are telling us inflation is here. I mean, just have a look at commodity prices. Um, obviously, price of copper, lumber, whatever, they came down over the last couple of weeks. I think that's a pretty normal correction within a new bull market. Uh, and therefore, we are pretty excited about the investment opportunities out there at the moment. And as you were mentioning, Ronnie, you know, the the objective of an independent central bank is to safeguard price stability, which seems very ironic considering that these these policies that they've instituted have have really basically led to this inflation and this this inflation in price um, or let's just say consumer prices and, and staple prices, right? Absolutely. I mean, um um, there, there's even a video uh, on, on on the webpage of the ECB for for kids actually um, that shows the deflation monster. It's like it's like a cartoon um, that should brainwash the little kids that that deflation is something bad. Deflation would be something normal in a different monetary system. We're seeing deflation in many parts, especially those parts where we don't see too much government intervention yeah i mean we're seeing deflation in in all things uh, uh you know all technical appliances um most of the uh, most of the technology that we use is highly deflationary however when you're highly indebted um, then of course deflation is the worst thing that can happen and 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 therefore i think it's it's some sort of a lie um, that uh, that we always hear and that most people for some reason believe that deflation is so bad because then people would just stop consuming and expect prices to fall and um, that would create a, 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 a spiral. I think the real answer is in our monetary system, we have to avoid deflation, whatever it takes. Um, and and that's uh, that's something that we we also described at length in our previous reports and in our books. And I think it's 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 important because that means as soon as 
the S&P goes down another five or 10 percent, as soon as volatility picks up, as soon as um, um, uh, uh, growth rates uh, collapse, I think um, then the Federal Reserve will have to make the next U-turn. And the big question obviously is, I mean, we, we saw that last year all taboos were broken. Now the Fed is doing um, um, QE at 120 billion a month. And now they're just starting to think about uh, 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 tapering. Um, but we know that they are trapped and, 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 and therefore, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious that once more deflationary pressure should be kicking in, they will act again and they will have to act much more aggressively than uh, over the pre previous crisis. So um, therefore, I think it's, it's really important to, to, to have a solid understanding of our monetary system nowadays because it's not a cyclical crisis, it is a systemic crisis that we are in. So, Ronnie, the, there's another part of um, another pillar that you went through here, the, the central bank digital currencies versus decentralized cryptocurrencies. So how are these central bank digital currencies really a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, obviously, I mean, um, we, 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 we talk about uh, cryptocurrencies uh, for many years now, and, and we, we analyze them, and we've got two funds that combine um, traditional gold, uh, or let's say uh, 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 normal gold to digital gold um, that combine uh, mining stocks with, uh, with uh, uh, silver and cryptocurrencies. So we're, we're pretty open to, to those developments. And, and I think it's, it's pretty interesting that, that uh, governments are using the momentum that we're seeing and this whole adaption uh, or adoption, sorry, that we're seeing um, uh, in this space to launch their own digital currencies that have got nothing to do um, with the idea of a decentralized currency, a decentralized currency that is based on technology and that is based on a network. So, so I think it, it is really, um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's an interesting development. And, and, and I think they, uh, it, it is pretty obvious that, that uh, central bank digital currencies will be introduced um, also in, in the Eurozone, uh, uh, in the US and so on. And we've seen lots of papers coming out from the Bank for uh, uh, International Settlements uh, also from the Federal Reserve, the ECB is, 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 is uh, putting in lots of effort. But I think it's got nothing to do with the real concept um, of, of decentralized cryptocurrencies. However, um, those digitized fiat currencies, they, they can be used, of course, um, first of all, uh, as they're doing it in, in Japan, um, to, to control you know every uh, every movement of, of, of money it's it's just stored and 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 this is definitely um, one thing that that uh, is, is pretty crucial for that development and the second thing is of course if everybody has got a digital wallet at the ECB at the Federal Reserve then you can say well you know um, it seems that the economy is not doing so well um, we'll put in some digital um, uh, euros or US dollars to your wallet and go st uh, start spending, but you have to spend it within the next uh, three weeks because otherwise we will delete it from your wallet. Stuff like that can be done with CBDCs. And I think that it's also, um, um, you know, one, one, another step in the direction of more financial repression that we're seeing already. Over here in Europe, for example, um, they're charging you um, negative rates if you have got more than 50,000 euros on your bank account now. It used to be 100,000, but now it's 50,000. Now, of course, people are looking for alternatives. They're trying to get out of the system. But I think that, that really those CBDCs are just one logical step in the direction of more and more financial repression. Um, we can be you know we can we can 
have discussions um, about it, but but I think uh, it's uh, it's it's pretty much useless because it's just happening, and um, and I think it's happening pretty quickly. As you're mentioning this this idea of basically forcing people to spend spend the currency that's in their digital wallets, Ronnie. This this really kind of leads down the road of, yes, you'll probably increase monetary velocity, but at the same time, that could have a negative effect because that will in turn maybe help erode that confidence in that currency, which could ultimately lead to um, hyperinflation, right? Yeah, yes, of course, but but in theory, you could also fine tune monetary growth uh, uh, much 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 easier. Um, however, I, I think that you know once it's interesting. I saw that um, uh, in um, uh, in a speech by uh, Mrs. Brainard, who who is probably one of the most interesting FOMC members. She mentioned uh, stable coins, she mentioned uh, CBDCs, and she also mentioned how important gold is to create trust in a currency. And this is something that that many people um, um, actually don't know. When the euro was introduced over here, the ECB advertised the new currency the, and said that, well, uh, we've got quite a lot of gold in our vaults. Uh, more than, more than 12,000 tons of gold are in the vaults of um, um, the Eurozone uh, member countries. And this was done to create trust in the new currency. And I think it, it worked pretty well. So, so gold is still some sort of a trust anchor. And in one chapter of the report, we write um, how likely it might be that, that, a, um, uh, that a CBDC with some sort of gold backing will be implemented. Is it is it going to happen? I don't know, but I think it's 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 a very interesting thought experiment, and 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 we have to we have to see that um, once you introduce a new currency, you really have to build up this trust. And as I've said, it it takes a while. And if you have something that worked really well for the last five thousand years, then I think um, uh, it makes life much easier. Um, so so. Can gold and CBDCs go together? Yeah, perhaps. Why, why not? Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how that ends up playing out, Ronnie. Um, you had mentioned yield curve control um, a little bit ago. So can you explain to us what the difference between this explicit idea of yield curve control and implicit um, yield curve control would be? Well, for, for, for an implicit yield curve control, they would basically say, um, well, um, with, with their with their wording, with their guidance, they would try to suppress um, uh, the yield curve. So um, they would say, well, you know, we've got the big bazooka uh, in our basement, and if yields go to uh, above two percent, we'll take the bazooka out. Um, and this this could work. This could work, um, um, uh, and it has worked uh, previously. Um, you know, just remember the the famous "whatever it takes" um, um, uh, 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 saying by 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 Mario Draghi. Um, but also, I mean, yield curve control is something that that we have seen in the past already. We've never seen yield curve control being introduced in peace times. But we know that public debt in most countries is at its highest level in peace times. So um, among the G7 countries, for example, only Canada and Germany have debt ratios of less than 100%. So if we compare it, for example, with the US, um, the US ended the Second World War with debt at nearly 120%. Uh, in the UK, it stood at 250%. And by the late 1970s, the debt to GDP ratio had fallen to 25% in the US and 50% in the UK. Now, I know that uh, you know, after the war, um, I think demographics were completely different. Um, whole countries have to had to be rebuilt. We saw a technological boom and so on. So we can we cannot compare it a hundred percent. But I think that one of the main things in getting 
um, getting the debt levels down was by uh, uh, f- was done by by financial repression via capping the yield on government bonds and capping them significantly below the rate of inflation. So I think that you know in March um, uh, of this year when when ten year yields went to one point seven five percent, I think many market participants were. Um, already getting really nervous, and we saw that that uh, the communication kind of uh, uh, changed, and yield curve control was mentioned more often. And from my point of view, it's it's only a matter of uh, of time until it gets uh, uh, introduced. If it's going to be implicitly or explicitly, I don't know. But I think that the big number, the two percent, might really be um, um, uh, the level where it will be introduced. Um, so I think it's going to happen. What does it mean? Um, it means negative real rates forever. And, and, and let's face it, I mean, we simply cannot afford significantly higher positive real rates anymore. That's just, just not going to happen like in 1980s, 1990s, where we saw real rates at 3 4 5%. Um, plus. So um, therefore, I think this is also basically the, the, the foundation of our positive view uh, 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 on gold. Uh, this is, I mean, that's, that's no, no big secret, but I think that people underestimate uh, what negative real rates over a longer period, what it does to your portfolio. And therefore, in the report, we also say, well, if this correlation between gold, uh, between uh, bonds and equities should reverse, and there was a positive correlation between bonds and, 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 and equities in 70 out of 90 years. So this negative correlation, basically bonds are hedging you as soon as a stock's correct. Um, this is not something that that we we saw in markets uh, all the time. It's it's rather the exception to the rule. So therefore, we 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 explain at length what um, a structural change in inflation does to your portfolio. And uh, just just one thing, equities that are always um, yeah said uh, being a fantastic inflation hedge. No, that's uh, it's not confirmed by the numbers. Uh, you really have to uh, focus on the um, uh, on the structure, on the on the sector. Um, are those companies price takers or, or price givers? Um, pricing power of the company. So that's that's really really important. So um, if inflation really becomes a structural topic, I think it's 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 going to have huge impacts for for portfolio allocations. And we crunched the numbers and 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 uh, calculated well over the longer term what what's the best inflation hedge? It's commodities, and on second uh, second place it's gold. Um, as easy as that. Mm-hmm. I think it would be really interesting to see, let's say, the market's reaction to uh, an explicit yield curve control like that. As we saw in this in this past week, um, the FOMC came out, as you mentioned, and said that you're thinking about thinking about raising rates. And we saw pretty much every market just get killed. So what are your thoughts towards short term moves like that, Ronnie? Well, to be to be honest, it it was brutal. And 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 I, I, I didn't expect that, that, um, that rotation. And I mean, let's, let's, let's recap what happened. Um, First of all, I think it was important that, that the nominal Fed fund rates, um, um, the, the projection rose to 0.8% from 0.5% uh, uh, in March. So that was 29 basis points um, for year end 2023. And, you know, we're, we're currently mid June. So year end 2023 is still 2.5 years from now. That's that's a pretty uh, pretty long time. Um, I think that nobody, and especially not the Federal Reserve, knows what will happen between now and 2023. Um, but I know that the Fed policy will remain ultra loose by its own projections. The Federal Reserve will remain behind the curve through 2023. But 
And, and this is, I think, the, the important takeaway. Um, the bond market and also the US dollar did respond to the fact that now we've got seven FOMC media, uh, members out of 18 seeing uh, a rate hike by the end of 2022. So it seems that Jay Powell has kind of lost control of, 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 uh, of the, 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 the committee uh, of the FOMC. Um, and from my point of view, this, uh, this, this leads to uncertainty and markets hate uncertainty. So we really don't know if, if they really moved, if they made the U-turn and they are now on this more hawkish path. And if they are, of course, what will it take to reverse that path? But, but from my point of view, I think the markets somewhat overreacted. Um, the big question that I, or the big questions that I would like to ask uh, Jay Powell is, first of all, how will you respond if we are seeing more downside surprises in the economic data in the coming weeks? And I think this is already starting. What is, um, uh, what is the consequence if, if the slowdown in the economy is broad and rapid? Then they would actually have to reverse that course again. What if US equities decline by, by 5 or 10% and, and if volatility rises sharply, then they would have to reverse. What if the, the, the sell-off in commodities and cyclicals is, is rapid? And what if inflationary pressures are coming down significantly? And I think if, if we've got a good uh, answer to those questions, I think we can, um, we can project the further um, the further developments quite, quite well. From my point of view, um, I think that f- over the next couple of weeks, I wouldn't expect too much from the price of gold. Actually, I think we've seen quite a lot of damage on the charts. Um, it is confirmed by the price of silver, which held up pretty well for some time, but then got smacked. Um, we're seeing um, pretty big reversals in the commodity space. We warned investors already in the in the gold report. We said we said that it's it's massively overbought, so the sector has to take a breather. And of course, the U.S. dollar. I think that the U.S. dollar will tend stronger over the next couple of weeks. Um, my initial estimate, and I have to say I, I was wrong on that. Um, w- when we um, played around that eighty nine ninety level in the in the in the Dixie index I thought okay this is it we will go significantly lower now it rebounded again but I think um, you know we, we we know the facts and we we know um, that actually as I've said at the beginning um, once we see um, 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 market participants expecting, uh, higher rates, I think the markets will get nervous very quickly because, you know, compared to the last crises, um, the problems are bigger, they are exponentially bigger, um, the debt levels are significantly higher. So even if we see um, um, uh, some rate hikes, I think, you know, at two or three rate hikes, um, this is it basically, yeah. Um, but now we are only talking about tapering now. So what do we expect? We expect, you know, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the September meeting, they will probably give us some more um, details. I think um, 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 uh, they will start tapering by the end of this year probably so so that's 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 our house view um i think at the jackson hole meeting they they will talk about it at length um but that actually doesn't make uh, uh me very very nervous and and i think on monday for example we already saw some sort of a bounce back uh in the inflation trade and a, as we're writing in the in the report from our point of view and this is really crucial from our point of view um Opposite to the views of the Federal Reserve, we are seeing a real structural move into an inflationary paradigm. And this is what we're describing in the report. So for us, um, if there is more panic in, in inflation markets, we're seeing it as a buying opportunity. 
And in that in that vein of of seeing a, a buying opportunity here, Ronnie, you have a, a really interesting chart that shows the everything bubble that we're currently in, except commodities. So is this is this little bit of a reversal in the in these commodity prices um, as you're saying a, a really good buying opportunity to get into some of these let's say lower risk trades as you see them yeah I, I, I would say so I, I I mean I think that um, what's the main case for for commodities first of all we saw a brutal bear market uh, nobody uh, really invested into new, new projects. Um, nobody is invested in the commodity space at the moment. Um, many institutional players are simply not allowed to invest in companies from the commodity space. So ESG is really becoming a, a, a big topic. And, and I think th- that makes me extremely bullish on, on oil at the moment um, because I think the whole ESG movement is really, really triggering a, a huge surge in oil prices. Um, on the other hand, I, I think when it comes to this everything bubble, we are seeing you know real estate prices all over the globe going crazy. We're seeing equity markets still doing extremely well. We're seeing the bond markets. You know, there's still 13 trillion trading at negative uh, yields. We just saw um, Greek government debt. I think it was the five years um, uh, being uh, being issued with a negative yield. Um, we're seeing it when it comes to the art market. Uh, we're seeing it in uh, old timers, whatever. Uh, 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 so, 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 from my point of view, it is a clear sign that people are losing confidence in paper and they want to get into real assets. We're seeing, um, I think, in the commodity space, um, really, really interesting developments that are also triggered by this whole new movement of more fiscal stimulus. So I think that people underestimate that while um, under the regime of uh, uh, monetary dominance, basically quantitative uh, uh, easing and TLTRO, whatever, I think it didn't have a, a real direct impact uh, on the economy and on inflation, while fiscal stimulus is working, you know, like like if you drink a Red Bull, it it kicks in very very quickly, yeah, and you you see that impact, and it it fades off very quickly, um, and I mean that's 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 also obvious. If fiscal stimulus would be so great, then why don't we just do fiscal stimulus all the time uh, and just uh, completely abolish our um, uh, uh, our market-based economy and, and and capitalism? But I think it's 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 important for people to realize we are now we should focus more on fiscal stimulus, less on monetary stimulus, and fiscal stimulus will impact commodities much much stronger and faster than monetary stimulus. So Ronnie, something you point out in the in the report as well is that mining stocks have had a 92% correlation to declining real interest rates. So mm-hmm. what considerations go into the right mining stock rebalancing strategy? Well, I think that's a, that's a fairly interesting uh, a chapter in the report where we, we said basically, well, what works in an environment of, of, of negative and of falling real rates? Uh, and, you know, it's obviously uh, 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 mining stocks are some sort of a derivative um, on, the, on the price of gold, for example. So um, I think a decoupling of mining of gold mining stocks versus the gold price is something that that I don't really see. I don't see um, uh, the HUY index um, showing a big rally while while gold is collapsing. That that's just not happening. And initially, we are seeing once stocks sell off, that uh, gold mining stocks really show this this equity risk, obviously. But then we are seeing that they react extremely aggressively. Um, on fiscal and monetary stimulus. So, so, so this is this this was really shown last year when when gold when, when basically everything went down. Um, correlations were 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 extremely high above uh, around all asset classes. Then gold started rising pretty quickly, and then gold mining stocks uh, recovered also very quickly. And I think you know from a from a portfolio point of view. 
it just makes sense to 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 add gold minings or silver mining stocks uh, uh, to your portfolio. We make the case for for um, mining stocks being a real value play nowadays. Uh, we're seeing pristine balance sheets. We're seeing strong free cash flows. We're seeing actually last year was the most profitable year uh, in the history. This year probably will be even better. So the companies really made their homeworks. Um, I think the market has not realized it yet, but at some point they will. And, you know, we, we show this kind of fun chart where we compare the market cap of Dogecoin, which doesn't have any use at all. I mean, they're sponsoring the, the Jamaican, um, how do you say, bob, bobsled team. Uh, but everybody knows that it's, you know, that it's that it's basically really useless and that it's just a, a meme coin. And we compare it to the market cap of Barry Gold and 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 Newmont. Uh, and actually, mid-May, um, Dogecoin had a significantly higher market cap than to those two huge mining companies that produce billions of free cash flow that have got um, uh, fantastic projects that have got gold in the ground and so on. So um, therefore, I think still, you know, there's, there's, there's a great opportunity in the mining space. I think that at some point, people will also realize that the sector is doing very, very well when it comes to the implementation of technology, but also when it comes to ESG. Therefore, we wrote another chapter uh, about the ESG developments in the sector. Uh, and therefore, you know, we, we're at those price levels. We're finding lots of attractive um, uh, companies to add to our portfolios. So, Ronnie, you, you guys have uh, another chapter in the book um, really going through findings from, from different jurisdictions for holding physical gold. Um, this year you have Austria, US and the Cayman Islands. And there's also a chapter to go along with the, the history of gold confiscation. So um, can, you, can you give us a little summary of, of uh, the history of gold confiscations and, and why it's a good idea to have, to hold maybe some gold, physical gold outside of your own jurisdiction? Well, we started writing uh, about um, proper gold gold storage and and which jurisdiction to choose um, already two years ago, and and we covered uh, Singapore, we covered New Zealand, Australia, Dubai, uh, Liechtenstein, and uh, Switzerland, I think. And this year we had uh, Austria, the U.S., and the Cayman Islands, and. And the reason for it was was mainly because we're seeing from from institutional clients we're seeing uh, much more demand and and people asking and those are really very successful businessmen and and very experienced um, investors they're asking us you know w- w- where should we actually store our gold and 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 I think it's it's interesting because this question didn't really come up. Uh, 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 five or 10 years ago. So it, it, it clearly shows us that um, people are kind of losing interest or, or losing confidence, losing trust in governments. And therefore, I think they, they want to diversify into new jurisdictions. Of course, there's not one perfect jurisdiction, but it's, it's important for us to explain the main advantages and disadvantages of several jurisdictions. When it comes to gold confiscations, of course, I mean this is something that that happened over the uh, uh, over the course of uh, of history quite often. And um, I think you know there's there's many different methods of gold confisc- confiscations. You can simply declare um, the ownership of gold contraband to counseling. Uh, to cancelling financial contracts, you can expropriate gold by force, you can uh, put on new taxes, whatever. And it, it has happened before. And, you know, in the US alone, we had four instances when, when private gold ownership was denied. We've got examples coming from, from Nazi Germany, from Australia, from Great Britain, and so on. But from my point of view, actually, um, you know, nowadays gold officially is no longer money. So paper money now takes that role. So consequently, our view is that the risk of gold confiscation is much, much lower. And 
Therefore, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty interesting to really walk through those confiscations. And of course, um, it's a, um, I think it's, 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 it's a fascinating chapter in the report. Um, if you learn more about, you know, uh, the 1933 confiscation, but also then the Bretton Woods confiscations, um, confiscations in in Italy, in 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 Germany, in the Czech Republic, and so on, it is really fascinating because you know, every year we think, well, what should we write this year? Um, we almost covered everything when it comes to gold, but then we come up with uh, such topics and we dive into those topics and find so many mm. interesting aspects. It's 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 really fascinating. So perhaps the most sophisticated confiscation of gold is is currently taking place in India. We're seeing this gold monetization scheme by Prime Minister Modi. Um, is it very successful so far? Not not really. Um, I think Indians know why they they hold their gold. Um, so so from my point of view, um, you know, people gold now unfortunately isn't legal tender. Um, gold was only confiscated when it was legal tender. So so therefore I think that actually the current fiat money system makes your gold even safer. And we make the case that gold actually could be revalued. So that the central bank, for example, says, well, we'll buy all gold uh, until the price of 3000 uh, per ounce. Uh, and this could be a way, this is something um, that uh, was was mentioned in, 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 in quite a lot of papers actually, and, and we quote them, this could be something to to further um, um, stimulate inflation because uh, I think that gold is a is a pretty reliable inflation indicator, and if the price of gold should should rise significantly, this would also tell people, well, um, we are seeing more inflation. And uh, as crazy as it sounds, this is actually what what central banks and 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 politicians want to see. So, um, do I see it as my um, my my main case um, that 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 uh, uh, a cap uh, or or a floor uh, uh, will be introduced. I don't know. Uh, perhaps it, it it could happen. I cannot rule it out. But I think it's it's really interesting to walk through this chapter and 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 I think it's um, it's actually one 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 of my favorite chapters in this report. Excellent, Ronnie. Well, as as usual, we we don't even have enough time to to touch all the all the topics covered in the report. As as usual, it's a it's just an excellent read. There's lots of um, lots of stuff to um, really capture your attention to um, make an enter an entertaining read. Um, and we'll a- absolutely put the uh, the link to the report in the in the show notes. Um, Lynn Alden, also um, a frequent guest of the show, contributed yeah. a, a chapter on long term debt cycles. Um, it's just uh, an excellent excellent uh, report as usual, Ronnie. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add as we wrap up here? No, that's that's it basically. I mean, there's it's a pretty uh, long read, three hundred and fifty pages. I think it's really. Um, it's it's good. It's a thought provoking. It's an entertaining read. Um, there's also a compact version, but I think you know if if you want to read something good over the um, over the summer, then then go for it. It's it's available for free in German and in English, and just have a look at our webpage. Yep, absolutely, excellent, Ronnie. Well, I always uh, I always look forward to getting to speak with you and and to read the report every year when it comes out. Ronnie, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.